Well, good evening, everybody. This is Ken Kabula with the Mid Michigan chapter. Uh, we sponsor the Investing Roundtable uh, every last Tuesday of the month. And you're saying to yourself, this isn't the last Tuesday. And you're right. Uh, we moved it back a week for this month because we didn't want to to butt heads with the uh, National Bank Virtual Convention. Mark and I and Cy were practicing for that uh, today, and it looks to be quite an event. If you haven't explored the details behind that convention, uh, sometime in the next couple of days might be a good time to go to the Better Investing website and take a look at what's being offered and whether it might be something you're interested in. We're co-sponsored by Manifest Investing, and I'm joined by uh, two of the regular knights, Cy Lynch from Atlanta. Cy is a longtime Better Investing volunteer, and Cy is currently serving as chairman of the Better Investing Board of Directors. And Mark Robertson, who for many years worked for Better Investing and now uh, is the chief managing officer of Manifest Investing, uh, gentlemen, I'm so glad to have you with me. I'm not sure I would want to be in this pool all by myself. Uh, to my right in the pool is Kevin Galagli, uh, a longtime volunteer with the Greater Washington, D.C. chapter. Kevin lives just north of Washington in the suburbs in Maryland right there. So uh, the four of us are going to do our best to attempt to give you four of our uh, better stock picks for the evening. Uh, and without further ado, let's take a look at the um, dis the uh, <laughs> disclaimer. The disclaimer. Okay, I'll get that out of my mouth here mm -hmm. if I can stop stumbling over my own teeth. Uh, everything we do is for education, folks. This is just uh, a demonstration, and we're talking about stocks and using them as examples. Uh, we're not making any recommendations for you to buy, sell, or hold anything. Uh, we hope we're going to give you some good ideas that you can go home and study and make your own decision about whether you'd like to keep them in your portfolio if you already own them or add them to a portfolio if you don't, or maybe delete them from a portfolio if you have them in there at the moment. Uh, if you'd like to be reminded about these roundtables, and we've been doing these now for upwards of 14 years, uh, you can get an email reminder by sending a note to nkavula1 at comcast.net. That's my wife's email. She'll add you to our guest list. Right now we remind about 1,500 people nationwide uh, that we're having a roundtable coming up, and she'd be glad to remind you of the same. That's the only email that comes out from mid-Michigan about the roundtable. And uh, we're not going to bother you, but if you'd like to know when it's happening, uh, drop Natalie a note. She'll make sure you get added to the list, and then each month you'll, you'll get a very short email with a link. If you want copies of tonight's slides, besides being posted on the Roundtable site at YouTube, uh, and we do have a pretty robust YouTube site now with a lot of different material on it, but besides being posted there, you can write an email to Mark R at manifestinvesting.com or send me an email, kkabula1 at comcast.net, and uh, either one of us will be glad to get those slides right off to you and uh, send you a complete PDF of, of the program uh, as it goes down this evening. So without further ado, let's look at our standing agenda. Uh, we've been using an agenda similar to this for our entire history. It's proved to be uh, very resilient, uh, very easy to modify when we need to. We're going to talk about how our tracking portfolio performs uh, in relation to the whole stock market. We're going to look at some stocks that might be on the hot seat and might be ready uh, for us to either remove or at least consider removing uh, from the tracking portfolio. Cy, then Kevin, then myself, then Mark, we each have an idea for you. We're going to take a poll and find out which one of those ideas you think is uh, the best idea for us to put in the portfolio. And we'll even add a thousand extra 
uh, imaginary dollars to the portfolio for the audience choice as well. Uh, if you ask a question during the session, we'll try to get an answer before we close everything down. And that means that, that uh, all or most of us will stay at the end uh, to make sure that your question uh, is answered, if we possibly can answer it. And if we can't, we're we're not shy, we're honest enough to say we don't know, and if it's something we think we can get an answer for in a reasonable amount of time, we'll let you know that too. So without further ado, let's look at our first meaty slide, our first information slide. This tells you how we're putting that portfolio that I talked about together. Uh, the idea of this roundtable began with each one of four nights uh, giving their best stock idea at a session just like this one, and then keeping track of those ideas in, in a tracking portfolio. It'll look a lot different than a personal portfolio because, like I said, we've been doing this for almost 14 years, and that gives us a lot of choices in that portfolio. Uh, we not only have core stocks, that's the up straight and parallel reliable stocks that Better Investing and, and myself uh, included uh, feel uh, should make up the majority of any portfolio, but we do take a look occasionally at non-core stocks as well. We like them to uh, keep uh, less than 25% of the portfolio, and we've been pretty good at maintaining that discipline. We'd like a long-term return in this portfolio to beat the stock market benchmark, and we're using the Wiltshire 5000 as a benchmark. We'd like to beat that benchmark by five points. So if the Wiltshire's doing 30, we'd like to do 35. If the Wiltshire's doing seven, we'd like to do 12. We do think that's what George Nicholson had in mind when he suggested that a good investment club should be able to do on average about 15% over a long period of time. That's because he knew that on average, the stock market did about 9 or 10 percent over long periods of time, and you take 9 or 10 and you add 5 to it, and you get somewhere around 15. We'd like to keep that plus 5 going, and we're very proud that we've been able to do that on a fairly regular basis. Our outperformance, the number of stocks that are outperforming the market, uh, our goal is 55%, and right now we're just a little bit under 50%. Uh, we've been picking some uh, sour cherries recently, and uh, I'm guilty of that, and I won't, I won't accuse any other knight of being guilty of that, but I think at, at one time or another, all four of us have picked some stocks that haven't done nearly as well as we expected. The most recent reading that we're looking at is a relative return. That means how much did you beat the market? A relative return of 5.4%. So over our entire history, the Wiltshire 5000 has performed at 9.9%, and we've performed at 15.3%, and the difference between those numbers is 5.4%. We're meeting our goal. That red line shows you that we've been meeting our goal mostly uh, for the last, uh, oh, let's say uh, about uh, five and a half, five plus years, uh, you did see we had a little bit of underperformance there a couple years ago. Uh, you all know what was happening a couple years ago, and we won't uh, go into that. Uh, I'm just glad we finally moved away from uh, worried about everybody making us sick and and doing some of the things we were forced to do for a long period of time. So, Mark, did I forget anything? I don't think so. I'll go ahead here, Ken. This is our top 20 right. holdings by percent of total assets or the value of the individual positions. Anything that you see in the header up at the upper left or legend, that is, those are the repeat selections. So, again, as Ken told you earlier, Anytime we make a decision, whether it's a knight or a damsel 
or the audience, we invest $1,000 into that particular issue. In the case of Microsoft, it's been selected five times. You see that right up here. And the $5,000 invested in Microsoft has become $81,000. So you can basically break down the entire table. Again, this is the top 20. If you want to see the whole list, that's available at this public link up here on the upper right. And uh, there's some pretty good stories in there, um, ranging from Amazon's two-time selection, which is now nearly 16000 to Costco, a one-time selection that is now up to $1,000 is up to 10 So you can kind of break it down. You can look at the total portfolio. Our Delix was number two. Uh, Google had a great month shooting up, and uh, so did Green Brick Partners. So they've both climbed the ranks here recently. Any comments or questions, sir? I'm getting some questions, Mark, on how you differentiate core from non-core. And, and I'll say that a lot of it's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, but uh, core, if you want to think of it, is essentially the kinds of stocks that uh, we would use to teach beginners how to use the stock selection guide. The, Old Faithful, up straight, and up straight and Parallel, the reliable growers, the consistent growing stocks, those that uh, have their earnings follow their sales and the stock price follows right along. Uh, we do like to look at the last three columns prior to the PAR column, the financial strength column plus the EPS column plus the quality column, and we've discovered that when those three numbers add up to about two and a quarter or more, you're usually looking at a core stock. And when they add up to two and a quarter or less, you're usually looking at a non-core stock. And then, of course, you have that gray area right around two and a quarter, maybe plus or minus 15 or 20 points, where it's up in the air. And you have to decide for yourself whether the stock is core or non-core. It's not a precise measurement, and Mr. Nicholson never chose to make it very precise, except to tell us that he thought about a quarter or less of your portfolio, and that could be less all the way down to zero, could be in non-core stocks, with the rest of the portfolio being in core. Absolutely nothing wrong with you investors that like to see your entire portfolio in those good old fashioned up straight and parallel stocks. But if you're a little bit more adventuresome, uh, Nicholson gave us room to wiggle around by saying up to a quarter or so of the value of the portfolio in non-core. Absolutely. So here's a look at our challenge stocks. Again, the total portfolio checks in at about, let's call it 13% or so. So we would like to be up in that 16.5% to 21% range as shown here. So we basically want to make sure that tonight we add some return. The quality is fine. The growth forecast is fine. It actually might even be a little bit uh, frisky. And one of the things that we always do at our sessions is... Uh, basically take a look at the companies that have the lowest return forecast amongst the active holdings. So those are the, the three lowest projected annual returns in the portfolio. Um, we're careful with NVIDIA because it's a tough one. Early stage company with high teen growth rate. Agilon we're going to talk about in a little bit. Micron Tech, again, that's, a, that's worthy of being on the hot seat and it's certainly challengeable. Uh, under most conditions. A little bit lower growth rate with that one too. So between that one we've had some companies that have lagged the market a little bit recently. Uh, we're, we, we believe we need to give them some time. Here's Clearfield. The regional banks they're just in a complete meltdown almost like a, a mob or a riot. Um, so we'll see. And some of the companies in the portfolio have actually been doing extremely well of late. And their relative strength index has actually climbed up above 70, including some large positions in Google and Microsoft. And as we said earlier, Green Brick Partners has been 
on fire. None of them are actually at uh, a relative strength index greater than 80, but they are up in that 70 range. So any thoughts on any of these guys? Yep. Mark, I've been doing this long enough to know that the analysts uh, act kind of like a pendulum in an old-fashioned grandfather's clock. And, and when they're moving in the direction where they're raising P.E. values for what they think should be a good solid average P.E., I think they tend to overshoot it. They tend to allow companies to get a P.E. that's maybe a little bit higher than they should. And I think in the last maybe half year, uh, when they've been trying to readjust those P.E. values downward, I think they just might have gotten their expectations a little bit lower than they need to be for some of these companies. And I would hesitate, uh, especially on these companies where there's lots of market, uh, and I'm talking specifically about Google and Microsoft, uh, there's a lot of market moving these stocks. Uh, in fact, some days it seems like those two plus two or three others are the only stocks trading. Uh, I would hesitate to sell them on valuation at the moment, at least, uh, because I'm just not sure that the analysts have, have got to the place where they they in, in, invariably say, oops, we got it too far, and now we have to go back to the middle again. So I kind of think that's where we are with uh, some of the bigger stocks. Yeah, the one on the left is Google, and that's just a daily chart going back six months. Uh, Google's up 20% since we last gathered for the roundtable. So that's what accounts for this. Uh, it's it's almost like a momentum. Or a, uh, it's, it's basically been on fire for the last month. And then if you take a longer term look at it on the right, it's actually not in that special of a condition. This was probably kind of special right here. Um, that's up there pretty high. Uh, taking out 90 on a relative strength index, I do find it fascinating that that's a bit of a ceiling on the right hand long term chart but uh, yeah they, these have been on fire uh, Mark I'm going to clear up some arithmetic uh, from a couple of our audience folks those last three columns on the dashboard uh, I'm just talking about the numerical value of those three columns uh, ignore the fact that there's some percentages there and we're just looking about 225 not two and a quarter not 2.25 just 225 with the uh, just the numerical value of the numbers strip away the fact that you might have a, a percentage or you might have other units attached to the numbers it's just a fast way for us to take a look and begin our decision about core and non-core. Uh, I see that there were three of you that thought I meant two and a quarter, and no, I didn't. I mean 225. Yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, here's here's an example. Micron technology is probably borderline. You add those two numbers together and you get something less than 200, those three numbers less than 200. Uh, there's no mystery about Agilon Health at 20 what is that 2745 total so that would not be a core holding at least not yet and no question about nvidia although nvidia is is kind of like uh that weird uncle at your big family gathering at Thanksgiving where he, he doesn't seem to, to match the rest of the folks in the family, but you love him an awful lot and you don't want to do anything to upset him and to, to kick him out of the family. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what NVIDIA, NVIDIA is at the moment except a super loved stock that seems to be involved in everything that the market is holding near and dear for the next 20 days at least. And so for the moment, I'll call it I'll call it core for the moment, but yeah. I think it could just as easily be non-core. Well, they're they're making some very important stuff. Just to nutshell it, here's Agilon Health. It was my selection a while back. It has slumped down a little bit, but I'm going to ask for it to have a a stay of execution. When you take a closer look at it, you do get something in uh, unexciting mid single digits here. But here's the story with Agilon. Uh, for me, as long as that continues intact, there's hope down here. And Ken says we're not supposed to invest in a price-to-hope ratio, but this is an example of an early-stage <laughs> company. It's not a small company, $3 billion in sales up here, 
and they're trying to work out basically and be a, a very key player in Medicare optimization. So it's a it's an interesting area. But this growth rate, as long as it remains this high and continues on this trajectory, I think uh, it's it's worth hanging on to just in case it finds the launch pad when these earnings actually pop up above zero. So that's my case for Agilon. Just could, like I, could, I just, could I just add, though, Mark, that to keep those sales moving in a constant upward direction like that, they need infusions of cash from somewhere. Uh, they can't just be operating on the the best wishes of their competitors or anything. So, mm -hmm. so somewhere they're generating cash. It's just not cash going to the bottom line. Uh, and it might be cash that somebody is uh, just handing them. Uh, after all, that's what these venture capitalists do on a lot of uh, instances, just hand you a big wad of cash and say, go to it, uh, make your idea reality, and let's see if I can benefit from your smarts. They do get something for that. We can check that on our, our form, our projected return on value calculation. They have as much cash on hand, basically, as their current total liabilities, so they're okay right now, but... As an early stage investor, you do have to watch that, uh, as Ken has suggested. Yeah, I have a hand in the air from Kate Smith. And Kate, uh, you're self-muted, so if you want to unmute, we'd be glad to listen to what you have to say. And I'm going to assume that's an inadvertent hand, and we'll continue, Mark. Go on. All right, so I think... What I'd like to do is just spend a couple of minutes. We do have it's 8:53. If we could just take a a couple of minutes and and talk about this debate, it's something that uh, I've gotten a couple questions about. This notion of sell in May and go away. That's simply a reference to the fact that generally January through May have, are some of the best months of the year in the stock market, and July, August, September, in some cases October, are the absolute worst. And yeah, it's a trading mentality, but what do you think? Uh, do you think it's safe to stay in the swimming pool? Go ahead, guys. Patience. No comments. Patience, long-term view. <laughs> Discipline. Ditto. The shark's kind of cute. I don't think he's anything to be afraid of. <laughs> you go in first. <laughs> Could be dangerous. Yeah, and I, I think that a lot of people, a lot of people that I've worked with actually are quite swayed by this argument that is largely a trading argument, and I, I just have not seen it work out very well. You know, long term for anybody. Who who knows when that next uh, major couple of days in the up market is going to come? So, just a, just a thought. Just a thought. Yes, that... and 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 market moves, particularly on the upside, do tend to happen very quickly. So if you're not perfect timed, you're going to miss out some or all. Um, and the other thing that you I'm sure somebody has done some individual stock analysis and you could come up with, um, you know, some data points perhaps to, to support that general proposition. But again, remember most times when you talk about the best performing months or worst performing months, you're talking about stock indices, mm -hmm. i.e. market chunks as a whole. We own stocks, not stock markets so for example yeah let's say that um, Microsoft and Google tend to stay hot maybe they won't maybe they've had their best five months of the year and they're going to start falling in May or flatten out in the summer but that momentum may still drive them higher now ironically that will also tend to drive the indices higher because they are major components of the indices but my point is, we own stocks, not stock indices. Mark, I have a hand in the air from Bill Wright. Bill, uh, go on. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself, Bill, 
Uh, but if you'd like to speak to us, that's what you have to do. I can't unmute you, Bill. And another inadvertent hand. So uh, folks, take a look right. Well, the hand's back up. And Bill, you still have to unmute yourself if you want to speak to us, OK? Uh, folks, take a look at your hand icon right now. It's down. Uh, there's nobody's hand in the air right now. So if you press it once, it's going to go up. And then I'm going to get a message here. And now I have a message from a lot of you that are testing that thesis out, OK? Uh, I'm going to assume that these are all inadvertent hands at the moment. And I'll come back to you uh, if you still want to talk to us in a couple of minutes, OK? Uh, go on, Mark. Uh, Mark, did we lose you? Sai, uh -oh. did we? Uh, well, I'm here. Am, are you hearing me? I'm hearing you just fine, Sai. Uh, I'm here too. <laughs> okay, Kevin. And uh, we've somehow lost uh, Mark for the moment. We'll see if we get him back. And Sai, uh, I think we're, we're ready. Uh, I'm not going to be able to advance these slides, Sai. So Let's hope that we get Mark back uh, as you begin your talk about Taiwan Semiconductor. All right. Well, we'll uh, talk about Taiwan Semiconductor. Um, it, it's the second time that I have brought it to the round table. I brought it back a couple of months ago. Um, and you can see here that it is a relatively up straight and uh, parallel um, company historically, as well as. Uh, the projections out the next uh, two plus years that you can see with those uh, green and blue uh, round dots. You can also see uh, value lines projections, 14 to 22 percent over the next three to five years. Uh, so they are expecting good things from Taiwan Simi. Next slide. All right, at least that's working. Uh, here's how I came up with uh, Taiwan Semi. It was actually a little bit uh, more circuitous than these next slides will uh, uh, show, but there's no lesson in it. So this is uh, pretty much how I got there. I, uh, no, I did not get it after eating at Portillo's um, <laughs> as an inspiration. But I, I said, let's take a look at the portfolio, see what we hold, and look at potentially accumulating something we already own. I'm looking for companies that either I brought to the portfolio or at least I have some knowledge of um, uh, Teletech Holdings, TTEC. There's uh, some question marks about that company going forward, and I just didn't want to uh, deal with it right now. It's uh, perhaps somewhat speculative if you read the value line and some other um analysis on it, but uh, it could still be a solid holding, but didn't want to bring it. Uh, I was very tempted by the financial stocks. Uh, you see two of them, first financial, I mean, first foundation and truest here, uh, but I decided not to go with financial or banks tonight, but uh, they were tempting. Um, and then I did not want to keep getting ribbed about uh, being a one-note pony or shifting around year to year uh, with favorites. So I left uh, MKSI alone. And uh, Infosys, I actually was looking at pretty close. Uh, but then I saw Taiwan Semi right in there, as you can see, uh, just above it, um, both being technology companies, though completely different industries with very similar characteristics. So I said, let's take a look at these two, next slide. Just a real quick uh, comparison between Taiwan Simi and Infosys. And uh, you could see I decided to go with higher growth rate, slightly lower PE, a uh, little bit higher financial strength, and a percentage point higher on the par. Next slide. Just doing a quick industry study uh, and comparison. Um, for Taiwan Semi in the semiconductor uh, industry, you see 
Taiwan Semi has a good solid the numbers again good time to really tighten your quality standards when you're in a market like we're in now where uh, uncertainty reigns next slide uh, this is just a rank by quality of course it's the highest uh, quality ranking although um, with the maybe exception of lattice semiconductor on this list being at 81 um, it's really hard just on an overall quality to distinguish a lot between 86 and uh, 100. Certainly uh, the 88, 89s and 100. But again, 100 is 100, not going to fight with that. Next slide. Oops, I must not have deleted that one out. I think that's an old one. Next slide. All right, here's a Taiwan Semi. Like I said, I mentioned it two um, months ago. Many uh, may be at least somewhat familiar with the company, so I'm not gonna go into great detail uh, on it, but we'll review what the company does. It's, it was the first and now the largest uh, dedicated chip foundry. What that basically means is Taiwan Semiconductor designs and makes chips. They're mostly a chip maker, not a chip designer. Other people design the chips, for their products and then bring it to Taiwan to manufacture. They had uh, over 57% of that market um, in the last year available, according to Morningstar. Uh, going by the name, their factories are mostly in Taiwan, but their customers range worldwide. Next slide. Uh, their products range the whole a gamut of semiconductor, that's just think microchip um, products from the uh, CMOS logic chips in computers to various memory chips used in all digital devices. Again, back to what we were saying about dedicated foundry, most of their customers are non-manufacturing, that they, they are called fabless. Uh, they design chips, but they don't make chips. And Apple, AMD, and NVIDIA are examples of uh, customers of Taiwan Semi that are fabulous. And uh, notice, I think down at the, uh, no, it's not the bottom, it's the next one, that chip makers, no, same slide, uh, the next bullet. Uh, as you can see there, there's a trend among chip makers, chip designers, to go fabulous, to uh, take their designs to companies like Taiwan Semiconductor to uh, manufacture. And AMD is an example of that. Uh, AMD, the big competitor to Intel, particularly in the computer, but also across the board uh, markets for many years fabricated their own chips, but they have in recent years gone uh, solely to designing and not manufacturing chips. And one advantage is that solely manufacturing allows Taiwan Semiconductor to be a technology leader. As chips get smaller and smaller and more and more powerful, you need highly specialized equipment and Taiwan Semiconductor uh, can uh, get that equipment. Next slide. Here's just the... Um, example of what I was talking about. Um, as those numbers get smaller, that think that's more advanced chips. And you can see right now uh, the five nanometers is kind of the uh, sweet spot, uh, if you will, as far as, as size and uh, chunk of the market, although there are smaller and smaller chips uh, as well. And there's uh, the seven nanometers and below revenue and how that is growing for Taiwan Semi over uh, the last, uh, what, two years. Next slide. Again, this is just our numerical show of their competitiveness. They are able, because of their um, technology advantages, to be more profitable than their competitors. And uh, you see that here on this graph. This is the um, 
online tools, peer comparison tool, looking at pre-tax profit on sales against uh, two competitors, excuse me, just one competitor on here. I guess I pulled AMD off uh, and the industry average as well as peer group. Next slide. And again, I left this, that previous slide was from the, uh, the previous um, presentation. Uh, next slide, there you go. That's the, that adds a quarter and I did put AMD back in that slide. Next slide. Again, this is, we saw by technology revenue breakdown a couple of slides ago. This is by platform or by type of chip, smartphones, um, and HPC devices, automotive, uh, and others. And you see they're well diversified across uh, the various types of um, uses for chips. Next slide. Here's my judgments uh, going in, um, projecting 11% uh, growth rate. That's roughly continuing the historical growth rate, maybe a little slower, uh, but right in line. Um, same thing, using the five-year average for expenses, but again, because of that technology uh, advantage, most analysts are projecting margin expansion. In fact, that's ongoing right now. You can see the trailing 12 months was almost 51% pre-tax margin. Value line is projecting 58% uh, over the next three to five years. I'm going to just be happy with the uh, five-year average and be pleasantly surprised on the upside. Um, those judgments then lead to uh, 885 um, earnings per share compares to value lines projection of 10 and manifest consensus of uh, 1275. Next slide. Then using um, potential high PE of 27 and an average PE of 18, I get a 23% potential high return or an average return using the average PE that kind of equates to the par on manifest uh, by methodology of 14.8. Uh, and again, the manifest consensus par uh, at yesterday's price was 18.6% compared to the 14.8 here. So again, uh, there's certainly some potential upside to my number. So I'm adding another uh, Taiwan semiconductor uh, chunk to the portfolio. Thanks. I think I'm back. Can you hear me, guys? We yes, can hear we you, can. Mark. Well, that's uh, Mark, I have a couple of folks with their hand up. Let's see if they have a question for Cy, okay? Uh, Dave Roberts. Dave, uh, you're unmuted. Go ahead. That's an in inadvertent. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Uh, and Judy Logan. Judy, go ahead. Yes. I was wondering what the tax consequences on this particular stock are. I read that they were up, upwards of 21%. I don't know what you mean by tax consequences. And uh, now I will, I will give a quick general answer, see if that hits what you're saying, and then we'll we'll see. Many people are wary of uh, ADRs, um, American Depository Receipts, which are foreignly, foreign, normally foreign headquartered as well as foreign traded companies uh, that are then sold on U.S. markets um, under the ADR format, which is not a direct stock. You're you're buying a pooling of the stock. Um, and they pay foreign taxes, particularly for investment clubs. And if you want to get all of your tax um, uh, tax benefit of owning stocks, uh, there's a few extra tax forms you have to fill out to claim a credit on your taxes for the foreign taxes paid. Because you can you can get reimbursement against your US, ta U.S. income taxes for any foreign tax paid uh, by a company that you own uh, that's foreign headquartered. Generally, that's not a whole lot. 
Um, I, I do it, but it's, um, for me personally, it's usually not a whole lot because most of my holdings are in uh, non-taxable accounts anyway. Um, so it, it's not a tax disadvantage. In fact, it's actually a tax advantage because you can take off the extra taxes against your U.S. taxes, but it's a more complication. And that's true of Taiwan Semi and all ADRs. I don't know if that's what you're referring to. Thank you, Sai. Mark, let's keep moving on, okay? All right, let's go ahead with Speedo. <laughs> well, I am Speedo. Look at me right there. Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Kevin Galogli. I'm in the D.C. chapter, and I'm going to uh, show you uh, uh, what I came up with. And let's just go to our next slide. So Mark, in his infinite wisdom, reaches out to me about 30 hours or so ago and says, hey, what are you doing Tuesday night? And do you have a stock for me? And don't whine about it, you know? <laughs> now, Cy and uh, Ken, my guess is that you probably knew well in advance that you were gonna do this. This is like the third time he's just sort of dumped this on me. And I'm sort of like the guy that you won't, that, you know, you need a fourth for it and you want everyone else until you come and go, oh crap, I guess we have to take Kevin. So, you know, that's the way I sort of feel like Nailed it is I'm, I'm the, yeah, I can see that. So, you know, so much for being a friend. Um, so I am going to whine about it. So I right. came up with the best I could under these circumstances. So let's move on to the next slide. Cool. So my old reliable and my, my standard is I tend to like to use the, the triple play screen. And I used it last uh, month when I had uh, 72 hours to come up with an idea. And, um, you know, so this is uh, cutting a little bit closer. And so I was going through this list and uh, Mark and I were talking about, OK, let's not do something that we've done before. So you can see the other roundtable selections that were sort of marked in there. And then I, I also like to look this time of year because of the better investing. They have their top 200 and there were a couple stocks that appeared up. But this this triple play screen just has two other parameters. It has it has the sales growth and it has core. It's not quite the 225, but in other words, I'm going to get something that should be pretty solid. So I looked through that and saw, no, okay, not too bad. And let's uh, let's go to our next slide. And I said, well, how about if I cross it over with Birken Road? And one of the people in the audience tonight, uh, Ken Williams, uh, we were supposed to both go down to Birken Road. I couldn't make it. He went by himself, but I had already registered for it and uh and the like and said okay let's see if we can find some stuff there so birken road for people who don't know is is part of the uh two lane business school and what they try to do is find underappreciated stocks from that gulf coast region and they have teams of students who sort of go together anywhere from four or five or six of them to be able to sit there and do an analysis of stocks that we don't normally see so um they they're their conferences uh, during the Jazz and Heritage Festival, or as investors would know, one week before uh, uh, Buffett in and, uh, and Omaha. So, and all of this stuff is free. So that's pretty good. So if you go to this Birken Road and you go under the research reports, you can find a lot of these. Let's go to the next slide. And so what I did is I, I've been creating dashboards on Manifest. They're public, so anyone can see them. And I used the start date of whenever the uh, presentation went. And so, if you look overall at these, is that the, um, the dashboard numbers are not good. I mean, you look at the pars and the qualities and the growth and you're just like, yuck. So there, there are really not too many that are, that are in there, but we do see one that was on the triple play pool. But then I said, well, let me sort of poke around and see what some of these others were. And those were the uh, other four interesting candidates and they don't repeat the stock. So some are, if you were in the spring, you weren't in the fall, and we'll take a look at it. But let's go to the next slide. And I like to do this is I'll ask uh, I'll ask the Knights here, which of these five? These are all the ones from Birken Road. And again, some of them didn't look really that good on, on the manifest uh, quality and par. Which one uh, looks the most interesting to you? I know we also ask the audience. Ken, is there one that you like out of that group? Yeah, I like I like D, but uh, I'd give C another look as well. Sai, how about you? Uh, D, um, I'm looking at, um, and I'll kind of go along with Ken on C, but A 
doesn't look too bad either. I like the angle of the uh, graphs, even though they're a little more volatile. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, do you have one? I think I'd go with E. I'm curious as to what there may be a, perhaps a temporary speed bump there in the first quarter of this year, but I think I'd rake E over so anyway, the anyway, they're, they're all, you know, they actually, again, they look pretty good, even though their quality and pores aren't there. So there could be some unique circumstances with those to take a look at. But the best one to take a look at will be, let's go to our next slide, will be C. And that's Company C, and that's Pool Corporation. And there's nothing quite like having, you know, just to let you know that um, we can guarantee that if you do your stock studies often enough, you will start to look like this. You won't have to go to the gym and work out. Um, this is what it really happens. And what happens with it is that Titan's best friend will come on over with their, their tennis balls and be able to help out with it. So this is going to get you that panacea that will promise you everything. The Pool Corporation has, uh, is really part of the S&P 500, but it's not in that the large group that we talk about you know, the Amazons, the Apples, the Microsoft. And so there's a lot of them that are right underneath it. And this is the world's largest wholesale distributor of, of you know, swimming pool supplies. And they're, they've done acquisitions that take them all over the world, but they're mostly a U.S. company. And they're out of Covington, which is just outside New Orleans. So let's go to the next slide. And so one of the problems that you run in with some of these stocks, and you see this a lot with the Birken Road, they're very cyclical. So that means that they, you know, expand and contract with the economy. And, um, you know, so they sometimes don't always have those up straight and parallels. And, and Mark was showing it with uh, the stock he was looking at. And here's some shameless self-promotion that if you want to look at a little bit more at the visual analysis of cyclicals, join us at, at Bink, where one of us will be making a presentation on visualizing cyclicals on the SSG. So let's go to our next slide. And so here's an elevator pitch. You know, what do you need uh, uh, someone for pool corporation? Who needs a pool guy when you got Carl Spackler over there on the far right to be able to sit there and clean your pool for you? Uh, and if not that, you know, you can clean it yourself like Jethro Bodine. He goes to the cement pond and be able to clean it up. Um, and Granny will be right there to help you out. But, you know, we have... Um, this uh, CNBC link, normally there's just have like two minute videos. This was about seven or eight minutes and they did a really nice job outlining some of the things, the demographic trends that are favoring them. You know, moving out to the suburbs and the exurbs, you know, people migrating into the South and Southwest and really a desire for outdoor living. So people are gonna be doing things like making a new deck and, you know, doing, you know, a whole range of different uh, things there and here's the thing is that even though a pool is discretionary once you have it the expenses to keep it up are non-discretionary and 60 percent of pool uh pool corporations sales are non-discretionary for stuff to be able to keep up with that so let's go to the next slide i'm, I'm just going to recommend that you step away from that bottle of moonshine <laughs> <laughs> well uh you know i uh, i don't know i may like it so let's <laughs> take, give credit to um uh, to Birken Road, and again, there's a hyperlink to the, this presentation. It's about 25 pages, and again, it was done in November. But here's what the students found. They found there's strong correlation between new home sales in these pools, and that it, pool, a pool corporation is the biggest player in this fragmented market. You know, it's really hard to find competitors with it on the SSG. You know, we talk about Home Depot, Lowe's, Amazon, but they don't really adversely impact them. And then there's a, a smaller company that the CNBC was talking about out of Phoenix called Leslie's. And they're only about 1 17th the si uh, sales size of, uh, of Pool Corporation. But look at that home improvement uh, graph uh, from Statistica in the lower right. And they also had one from Pool Corporation that showed how many new uh, in-ground pools are being built and the lines are basically paralleling, paralleling that. So it's something to really keep in mind. So go take a look at that uh, presentation. It's a PDF uh, over at Birken Road. Let's go to our next slide. So here we are up straight and parallel. Don't we like that? That all looks good. Can't complain with it. Uh, the Morningstar financial health grade is B, so that's above average. And again, it's a pretty straightforward business to take a look at. Next slide. Last month, I was talking about the semiconductors and how they are involved in everything, including the Internet of Things. 
And here you are, you have the two companies that we're talking about, Leslie and Poole, and both of them have apps to be able to sit there so that you can be able to monitor what's going on in your pool, the water quality and stuff like that. You can link it up with the person who's taking care of your, um, you know, when Carl Spackler comes over to, to clean your pool, you he can have the app too, and he can be able to know what he has to bring to take care of it. This all happens because of semiconductors. So this shows you the far reach of semiconductors because they have to be in those internet of things with that. Anything that's Bluetooth enabled have to have semiconductors. I'll say this, that uh, the Pool Corporation app looked really kind of clunky compared to Leslie's in that CNBC story was talking about how uh, the Leslie people they were talking to were saying that uh, they get a lot of their movement from digital. They apparently have a very strong digital presence. Now, I live in the city, I live in a high rise, and so, yeah, we don't have a pool, um, and uh, we don't even have a cement pond. But anyway, uh, just to be able to take a look and keep that in mind, let's go to our next slide. So here's Leslie, since we're hearing about it, and we can tell right away it's not covered by Manifest, uh, and that, that you know, if there is some promise with it. It's, just, it's like, uh, we got to put this back in the oven and come back in a couple of years. It was publicly traded. It went out as a, uh, it was uh, bought out by, um, um, what am I thinking of? Uh, um, venture capitalist or, or um, what am I thinking private of? Private equity. Yeah, private equity. And they just brought it back out in, in 2021. So that's, even though it's been around a long time, um, it just, we don't have any real history until 2021. So we'll save that for later. Let's go on. So there are some kind of interesting strengths, you know, again, it's a highly cyclical, You've, you know, once uh, you got to have money to be able to do this, pool grows by both organically and acquisitions. And what happens with those acquisitions, they have much higher debt and stuff, but the analysts don't seem to be really that, um, you know, worried about it. It doesn't have the super, super growth of, of like a Taiwan semiconductor, but it's really good. Here's the thing that's interesting. This is the Morningstar thing. And you see that it has a three stars there. And you see that Q next to it. That means that it's a, it's just quantitative. It's not like an analyst covers it. And almost always with a Q rating, the economic moat is gonna be no or uh, narrow. And here's probably the first time I've seen a Q rating for Morningstar with a wide moat for something. In other words, an analyst isn't covering it and they still think it has a wide moat. Really, really interesting on that. Next slide. So rather than going through all the points on uh, on the uh, SSG, I'll just sort of tell you I did my future sales at 12, my future earnings at eight using a preferred procedure. Um, you know, I got a um, high and low PEs of uh, 27 and 16. And uh, you can see sort of all my judgments there. I'm thinking somewhere between a total return of 17.7 and, and a par of 12.7. You compare that with what you see on manifest at 14.1, that looks pretty good. And I also like the double check of the caps rating on manifest. Uh, that's the Motley Fool, that's their consensus estimate. And there it has four of five. And so the, they tend to be a little bit friskier. And the thing is, is that I'd say this after looking at Birkenrode, Birkenrode stocks almost look a lot like Motley Fool stocks. They're a little bit friskier than what we would normally see. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they're not good stocks because again, the, when we did those blind looks at those, those, those lines really weren't all that bad. But here's a, a pool corporation. I have it as a buy. Um, and I think most of my metrics I feel pretty comfortable with. Um, you, this is a lot, you know, it's gonna bounce up and down because of the cyclicality of being in this industry. But I, I think overall, if you have a long-term perspective, this would be one to take a look at. Uh, let's go one more. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't do an SSG. I, I just sent it into first cut. And a lot of those stocks are on triple play. Here's another shameless plug. The DC chapter and the Maryland chapter do their own monthly uh, digging into the BI on the first Monday of the month. And there were five of the stocks that were already in there. So you can come and see us after you go over to uh, Manifest channel and uh, like their stuff. Come on over and say hello to us. That's it. All right. Thank you, Kevin. And give me a little bit more time next time. Yeah, I'll call you Sunday evening for Tuesday. <laughs> well, right. I'm going to do uh, I'm going to do Avnet again. Uh, I did Avnet two months ago. Uh, I was very impressed with the stock. Uh, two months ago, it was a triple play, and its value line had just come out, 
uh, and I read everything I could read. This is an old company, a very old company, uh, but they're doing things uh, in a bright new way. Avnet uh, distributes electrical components, including semiconductors and a lot of other things that are related to the need for semiconductors. So uh, you need a lot of other uh, peripheral materials, peripheral uh, 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 stuff in order to get semiconductors working in whatever you want them working in. And Avnet basically is a distributor of those things. Uh, we're going to look and see uh, a little bit about the company. If you can go to the next slide, Mark. Uh, they started back in 1921, so they're over 100 years uh, old, and they were distributing radio parts. Uh, a lot of you understand what I mean by radio parts. Uh, uh, I was part of the generation that uh, was given a paper bag full of vacuum tubes and told to go up to the drugstore and test them in the machine, see which one didn't work and replace it. So you could buy TV and radio tubes way back uh, in the dark ages uh, where I uh, date myself uh, from. Uh, they moved to a little bit more complicated things in the 50s. Uh, moved in the 80s to supply chain uh, issues, global distribution in the 80s, and today they're basically distributing anything that you can distribute, and they're focusing it around this semiconductor and the internet of everything that we possibly can be talking about. Next slide. They divide their business into two businesses, the electrical components, and you can see on the left-hand side there, the left-hand circle, that that's over 90% of their business. About 8% of their business is a brand new, higher margined business called Farnell. And Farnell basically makes kits out of all the different components that they distribute to different companies throughout the world uh, and makes kits where companies that are manufacturing things, creating things, especially creating electronic tools of almost any kind, uh, can test those tools along the way and see how well they're working. There's also a room for uh, people to talk with uh, you and to give you guidance and to help you along the way when you're developing something brand new for your business. And that's this Farnell business, again, much higher margined, but a very small piece of the Avnet business for the moment. Uh, you see that region-wide, they're worldwide, about a quarter of their business in the Americas, about a third in Europe, the Middle East and Africa, and the rest of their business less than half, uh, but just a little bit less than half in Asia. And again, most of their business revolving around semiconductors, uh, three quarters of their business revolving around semiconductors. Next slide. Uh, these electrical components, uh, you can read this, uh, the sales are strong and they've continued extremely strong uh, into this year. Next slide. And the Farnell business uh, has really been taking off. And again, uh, this is a pretty decent margined business. And uh, reading between the lines, I think that this is one of the places where Avnet hopes to begin to improve their total net margins by increasing this Farnell business. It's a much more complicated business. It uh, takes a lot more uh, touch to the various customers, uh, but in the long run, it's much more profitable. Next slide. Uh, I went to Manifest real quickly where I got the idea in the first place because, again, it was a triple play stock. Uh, and I get a Manifest par value of about 20 and a sales growth of 6.4. I went to uh, value line and I got sales growth of nine, earnings of 22 and a half. And you can see the projections for earnings. Now these slides were not touched from two months ago. This slide was exactly the same as two months ago uh, with a slight difference in uh, the par coming from uh, manifest because there was a very slight difference in price between two months ago and now, less than a dollar. 
Next slide. There were no projections coming from Morningstar. Many of you know on our tool, if you go to the uh, lower right-hand portion that uh, down where I've uh, blackened in under the legend, sales detailed estimates and EPS detailed estimates, if they exist, pressing those two legend pieces will bring them to the graph. Well, they did not exist. When I pressed them, nothing came up. So I went to the research tab and I added the projections, only I used value line numbers. So these three dots for 2023, 24, and 26, these, uh, yeah, 26, these three dots are coming from value line for sales and for earnings. And you can see that while there's a little bit of an expectation of backing off, uh, they felt they had drawn a lot of business forward during COVID. You can see in the long run, they're going to move to the trend I set. And in fact, if I'm to believe value line by the five year mark, they're going to move well past that trend. For the moment, I'm going to use six and 7% growth uh, uh, sales and earnings because that's exactly what I used two months ago. Next slide. During those two months that have passed, uh, new sales figures, a new quarter has come out. You can see that uh, Value Line had suggested that sales would be 6175, and they actually came out at 6515. Uh, that's a little bit uh, bigger than you would have expected. It's a surprise of, of upwards of 12, 13 percent. You can see that the earnings suggestion was a buck 75, and they actually came out at 203, and that's another maybe 12, 13 percent uh, excess surprise side. I'm figuring to myself if Value Line likes this stock. And if the third quarter comes out and there's a surprise of plus 10% in both of the numbers and everything else stays basically the same, which it has, I'm suggesting that Value Line still likes this stock. The price has been pretty flat uh, going from uh, two months ago to today. Uh, you can see that the sales year over year were only up slightly, but Value Line had expected a uh, kind of a decline of this whole idea, again, about having pulled business forward during COVID. They were going to have a couple of rough quarters kind of going back to normal. Next slide. Here's my SSG. I'm using an upward PE of 10 a downward PE of three, that's adding to 13. That's only a six and a half PE for an average PE. And here's the reason that I really like this stock. Uh, at that low PE value with all of these reasonable or very conservative expectations, I'm looking at an average yield of about five and a half percent. Uh, I don't think there's any uh, ever been a time when I've been able to find what I consider to be a decent growth stock that's going to give me a yield uh, at this particular level. So I'm kind of uh, feeling good about the yield. If we finally do end up talking ourselves into a recession, a yield is going to be something that's going to be really nice to have as we move through what I hope would be no recession or a very slight recession. But yield is yield is yield, and I don't mind having the cash. Next slide. Uh, all told, I'm getting 19.8 on my SSG. That matched coincidentally exactly the number I was getting from Manifest for their par. And I'm asking you one last question. When's the last time you read a final value line paragraph like the one I've quoted in the upper right on this slide? This is a direct quote 
from the most recent value line. I've been reading value line for, oh, maybe 22 years. I cannot remember them telling me that I should own a stock. That is interesting, for sure. Good stuff. It sounds like we're done. We can just uh, just vote for Ken, and we'll leave it like that. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think the, the rest of our time is wasted here. <laughs> Except I happen to remember that time when he brought Facebook. He said, what's not to like? <clears throat> Well, and I wish I would have held on to it, okay? <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, it, it's bouncing. It's bouncing back. All right, I'm going to run you through really quickly through a, a current situation analysis. Uh, I also used Manifest for the stock screener, basically looking for companies in their top quintile, excellent companies with a quality ranking greater than 80, uh, with the average stock at 11.5%. As is shown there, I wanted to search for companies uh, at least five percentage points above that. Again, I, I think the the world economy is turbulent and it's it's uh, precarious enough that a financial strength of B plus plus, according to Value Line, makes a lot of sense. Something that Psy does during these type of economic conditions. So I want a minimum of 70. Then I also wanted to honor Hugh McManus and stick within. 20% of a 52-week low, looking for some of those. That column is shown right here. So if the company was with, within striking distance of its 52-week low, I wanted to know about it. And you can see there's several here that are in single digits. And then I also wanted to try to find companies that had been beaten up and their stock price had been crushed. So I went searching for relative strength indices less than 35. That column is not shown here, but these are all companies that fit that description description again you have longevity company i'm going to use tonight mp materials we've talked about previously it's one of our best small companies for this year uh heavily entrenched in getting the right type of metals into uh electric vehicle production etc qualcomm for another chip stock that comes up uh, long time community favorite and then of course we have a number of banks uh, regional banks that are cropping up and i do think they are worthy of some attention. I, I tried to get the courage to go for one. I'm probably going to regret not adding to either uh, Service First or Western Alliance here at this session, but we'll see what happens. Instead, going with this uh, company, uh, Ingevity, I had not ever spent any time with it. It's on the list uh, right here, and uh, I had basically promised myself that I would take a closer look because it kept showing up in a variety of areas. And David L. Babson is one of my favorite contributors to Better Investing Magazine, going way back to the 1960 time frame. And this was one of his favorite industry studies, specialty chemicals, uh, for all the reasons that are there on the right or the left that you can read. Uh, again, a lot of names that we know, Sherwin-Williams, WD-40, PPG, we know all these companies. The ones that capture our attention are the pot potentially too good to be true or slightly too good to be true, longevity when it comes to their return forecast. And then down here, you could do pretty well studying Elber Marley or Inter International Flavors and Fragrances. Uh, those are two pretty good returns. Those are two very good companies. Elber Marley is in the uh, lithium stuff and uh, special metals that are required for things. So. Again, any one of those three is probably worthy of study within this particular industry. You can see that Ingevity does rank near the top from a quality standpoint here. Uh, one other quick look just to see if there might be something else out there barking that uh, had a, a very low relative strength index. Just, just went looking for it. And uh, again, I'm looking for something hopefully less than 20, certainly less than 30. And Ingevity does fit the bill here down at the bottom. I, I kind of lose interest in these single-digit growth rates. Uh, Ubiquity is probably worth a, a look, but I don't understand much about that company and uh, would have to dig quite a bit deeper. And the, the numbers down here at the bottom are just simply resonating. You've got a 20% return, basically a 19 20% projected return on value. You can see that the Morningstar and Analyst Consensus uh, concur. Value line, that's a decent number. So the numbers across the board are pretty good. The average company out there right now has an 8% increase 
for 2023 sales over 2022. So this is okay. It's a number that we've been watching and probably we'll talk about more in both sessions. So longevity again, meets the uh, on sale or oversold, undervalued uh, test. Lo and behold, as I was trying to figure out who they are and what they do, I'm not going to go deep into that, not as deep as some of my colleagues do here, but they had their investor day yesterday. And if you go to Google and you just simply put in those three words, you will get to this presentation. You can also get there from the Ingevity um, Investor Relations um, portion of their website. It's a good presentation. It will take you through a number of things. They do spend a lot of time being green. It's one thing that... Uh, uh, has to be noticed. They they control pollutants coming out of automobiles and industrial processes, and uh, this gives you a little bit of feel for the extremely diverse number of areas that they're into, from wind turbines to uh, lubricants and aerospace, automotive. Uh, they do renewable energy and fuel. They actually do some agricultural uh, oil production, um, things like adhesives. Uh, a big portion of their business is in asphalt and oil field services. Again, the emission captured down here, they go into a lot of detail about that. Uh, they're in water purification, the production of some other materials that are some petrochemical based, some basically recovered from a number of industrial processes. And uh, again, looking at an area that they're spending a lot of time with, their carbon content in whatever solutions are developed for electric vehicle batteries. So I kind of like the whole general feel that I get. And again, you can look at the, the chemistry and the materials at the investor relations presentation, but it, it, this does resonate with me uh, pretty strongly. Here's a look at the company. Again, it's a company that was formed by a couple of spin-offs, including West Vaco a few years ago. They're headquartered out of the Charleston area in South Carolina. It's actually North Charleston, and they have manufacturing facilities across that entire basin all the way from western Kentucky uh, back to the South Carolina area. Um, there's a lot to like here. Uh, first of all, we see a projected annual return at relatively high levels compared to where it's been in recent years uh, and increasingly uh, improving quality situation. I like the sales. Again, this is a theoretically cyclical area. You can't find a whole lot of cycles in what we're seeing here. Again, not sexy, not terribly exciting, but approaching upper single-digit growth of 8% or so. Again, that's okay. Mid-sized companies can be wonderful for us. So we are looking at a company in that 8% growth range. You can see that their earnings have continued to uh, progress. Again, not, uh, not in rocket ship form, but at the same time, Anytime I see a price formation or a price trend that's headed down while earnings is headed up, it just sings to me that this thing could be becoming more attractive. So at an 8% growth rate, a 13% margin, their margins are very consistent, operating margins at about twice that, with a P.E. ratio, average P.E. ratio of about 15, you are looking at a company with a low 20s return and uh, the, the reconciliation with projected return on value is also strong. So we are looking at a potential 20% return animal. And uh, I like the story, and I think it's worth uh, tossing on the pile. And uh, that's my David L. Babson Memorial Selection for the roundtable for this week, or this month, I should say. So with that, Ken, I think we can go ahead and go to the poll if I'm still here with you. We're still hearing you, Mark. That's good. So let's see if we can. And by, by the way, any of you that are new here and have not done any uh, digging on David L. Babson, it's worth a Google search. Okay, uh, the poll's open. Uh, we'd love to have about... 85, 90, 95 percent of our folks voting. It doesn't take very much. Just use your finger if you have a touch screen um, available or your mouse uh, or whatever your platform responds to. 
we're up to about three quarters of you voting. I'd love to see it move a little bit higher. We just hit 80%. Doesn't cost anything, absolutely free. Where's the last time you got something absolutely free outside of Costco, okay? <laughs> Birkin Road reports. Birkin Road reports, okay. And the hot dogs are still $1.50 at, at Costco. Okay. And uh, I'm going to count to 10 backwards in my head here, and then I'm going to close this down. And I'm going to indicate that it was a really close race. And uh, this time our uh, extra position will go to Taiwan Semiconductor. 29% uh, of you thought that was the best one to put the money into, 20. I'm sorry, Mark, I am reading this incorrectly, and I apologize. This is a sincere apology, Mark, because I didn't read this correctly, okay? No, I think you uh, read it right, Ken. I think there's something got slipped in at the last uh, second. You know, if you're going to go into uh, your Steve Harvey imitation, you could show up with my publisher's clearinghouse. Okay, well, uh, we're going to put the extra position in Ingevity at 32%, a little bit less than a third. Uh, Cy was a real close second at 29%, and uh, for that matter, Avnet was a pretty good third at more than a quarter. Uh, and we have 2% of the rear. The rear was <laughs> bringing up the rear. <laughs> he's, he's going to blame uh, that on the yeah, short amount of prep time. Hey, two um, percent of the folks that didn't didn't pick any of them belong in the portfolio. So we will put two positions of Ingevity into the portfolio for next time. We do have a hand in the air, and he's been very patient. Uh, Dave Roberts, Dave, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Oh. Come on, am I unmuted? Yeah. Be responding when there, I click it. <laughs> you're unmuted. Go ahead. We can hear you. It's inadvertent. It doesn't seem to be responding when I click it to try to turn it down. Okay. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay. And uh, Mark, if you can take that down and go to our next slide, then. Okay. Okay. Can you see the screen? My screen now. We back with me. Uh, I'm uh, trying to get this poll down. Give me just a. And I, I think that we probably should think about adding uh, an audience position to the top three. Those were all within three or four percent of each other. And since the. I don't know. You really want to rub it in, we, right, Mark? We don't have any rules for that. <laughs> well, well, Mark, I'm, I'm going to say that. Uh, that uh, we we just are going to defer to you. We don't see you winning one of these very often, and we we would like you to, to have the the full glory of the night uh, rest on your right. shoulders. Okay, I, I I will definitely make some hay with it, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to think about all three. All right, just a reminder for everybody that we do take in and archive these presentations on YouTube. Happens to be the Manifest Investing channel. Uh, as co-sponsors, and we do also include our sessions. We refer to them as bull sessions. Those are Tuesdays at 2 o'clock, and uh, previous roundtables. You can see the session from last month with Candace Baker and the team is there if you want to take a look at it. That has been popular, and we've gotten some considerable feedback on that. So, again, YouTube, Manifest Investing. You can put roundtable in if you want. You will find this page. Last but not least, we do have some things coming up. All of us will be making presentations during the cyber version of the National Convention for NEIC Better Investing uh, on the June 3rd and June 10th dates. A couple roundtables coming up. Cy is appearing in Atlanta. Ken, are you going down for the Atlanta? I will be in Atlanta as well on August 19th. Uh huh. So that is Ken and Cy in Atlanta. And uh, Ken and I will be in New Orleans, and we do have other stuff that I, one of these days we need to catch up and get uh, some of the other commitments nailed down and uh, put into place on here to Ken, so we will do that. Okay, sounds good. We'd like to thank you all for being here this evening. We had a really nice audience. Uh,
and we'll take our, uh, oh, I don't want to say it that way, uh, we'll be dressed the next time we see you uh, <laughs> at, at, at the uh, round table here uh, for our June round table. We will go back to our normal last Tuesday of the month. So if you're marking your calendar, mark it for the last Tuesday of your month at 8.30 in June. And if there's nothing else, a, a really big thank you. Uh, Kevin, all kidding aside, uh, we really appreciate your uh, ability to put together a really good presentation, but on top of that, your willingness to help us out when we're in a bind. And Sai, as always, we can't do any of this stuff without your continued support. Uh, Mark, uh, you've just been a, a solid rock for the chapter, and we appreciate all that you do for us. And with all of those good things being said, uh, I think it's time to say good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks for having me. Okay. Good night, boys. <laughs>